Well, we talked a little bit about EPDs and genetic evaluation the moments ago, and I guess I would like to begin. Dan, can, can you just give us a skinny, a quick definition of what EPDs are and how are they developed? Sure, Kevin. So an EPD is an expected progeny difference. That's the idea that we're combining data from lots of different seed stock, in some cases commercial operations, with pedigrees, with genomics, and we're using all that information to make the best prediction of that individual animal in terms of what their progeny will do when you use that, that bull in this case in, in a breeding program. It's not a predictor of him, it's a predictor of his progeny, which is what really matters. But that number accounts for environment, it accounts for the, the competition in terms of who his cattle were compared to, all the, all the, the noise in the data is pulled out and so you get a pure genetic value that's, that's comparable within that breed so you can make the best decision to get an outcome that you want in your particular operation. So that brings up an obvious question. There's a lot of data and, and, and I see a lot of bulk sale catalogs that include all the EPDs together with birth weight, weaning weight, ultrasound data, scrotal circumference, on and on and on. Chip, is it more important to evaluate the EPDs or the actual data or should I be looking at both? Uh, great question, and just to dovetail off Dan, um, so that actual data, that actual birth weight, for uh, instance, when you open that bull catalog, it is important, but it's not important to the person looking at it on that day. That was important to your seed stock provider. That actual birth weight was incorporated into a seriously thoughtful genetic evaluation. And so that's already built into your birth weight EPD, your calving easy EPD. So, a couple things to consider. If, if you don't believe that your seed stock producer is using those effectively, find a different seed stock producer, okay. okay? And then also recognize, we all know this, that a birth weight from the same mating here in San Antonio is distinctly different than the weight that calf's gonna come out if they're in Bismarck, Absolutely. or if it's a spring fall. And so again, the raw data is important, but it's important to the serious seed stock folks who are using it behind the scenes to incorporate those EPDs that Dan spoke yeah. about. On sale day, that is a very risky measure. It has essentially zero predictive capability sure. to tell you how those calves are going to come. And, and as we've talked, Dan, I think last year on, on the uh, program, uh, you select for a low actual birth weight, you're probably going to get a calf out of a heifer. I mean, that's what you're selecting for virtually, right? Yeah, you start to give up. And this goes back to some conversations from the last segment and that if you overemphasize, and that's what you are doing then, if you're double dipping and using data along with EPDs and you're confusing your, your own self, you're ultimately selecting against, again, in this example of birth weight, you're selecting against growth at a heavy level, and we all still sell pounds. Sure. Colin, what would you add? No, I would agree that uh, EPDs are, are definitely the most valuable tool that probably comes out of breed association today. Uh, there's no doubt that those individual measures are important and they give assurance to the breeders and those guys that are making purchases and selection decisions. Uh, but without a doubt, the EPD definitely lends more integrity and true genetic merit uh, to what these cattle are and what we expect them to do. You know, the seed stock industry has uh, been guilty from time to time of chasing fads and trends. Having said that, believe it or not, Chip, that's right. Having said that, it's important to recognize what downstream customers are wanting and what some of the macro trends are in the beef industry at large that are gonna drive the genetic needs of, uh, of the beef industry. Mark, what are some of those downstream consumer needs and industry-wide trends that you think should we, we, we should be factoring into our genetic decisions? The key word is what you said is downstream. We tend to think of our own cow herds, Kevin, and I think as we look at the business and you look at the history of the cattle business, the one thing you know, things change. Um, genetics change, we've all changed the kind of cattle we're making today um, from what they were 20 years ago. But as we look at the big picture, I think that we, we don't want to get too far out over the edge, but be cognizant of what's going on with consumer demand and what's going on at the next level in these feed yards. I mean, look at today. We're feeding finished weight slaughter cattle up to 15 and a half, 1600 pounds is common. And we were just at 13 and a half here a few years back. Um, so we need some cattle with some outcome that can get some dry matter conversion, good average daily gains. It's a big deal as we look at the next thing as far as saving costs and just total dollars on feed efficiency and dry matter conversion. Uh, look at the choice select spreads. I mean, it used to be $10. Now we're out, get as wide as 24 to 30 as we get seasonal in the summer and back in the fourth quarter of the year. Um, we know we've got those big premiums and we've got those export markets. So I think those things are all things that we need to be cognizant about as we're trying to uh, provide seed stock to producers that are trying to increase their bottom line and re effectively just trying to stay with the market. But I think 
sometimes we reach too far, we still stay, need to stay middle ground and not single trait select. Um, but we definitely got to be uh, coherent of what's going on in the industry and the folks downstream and ultimately the consumer. Dr. Mask, what would you add? Well, I think that um, everything that Mark said is true. I think we've got to look downstream. What does our buyers want? Uh, especially in eared cattle today, uh, you know, looking at that carcass quality, that choice and select uh, spread that uh, Mark was talking about. Um, you know, people that are retaining ownership of females. Uh, what are they doing uh, with uh, age of puberty and fertility right. in these cattle? And in two, and in, in, in since 2017 with the VFD and the veterinary feed directive and, and maybe some limited use of antimicrobials that we're gonna have uh, to use in these cow herds deal. as well, is you know keeping our cow herd healthy. Sure. Uh, you know, using that veterinarian uh, to really make some of those key decisions is gonna be a trend yeah. uh, to make the consumer understand as well that, that our main focus is food safety yep. and that our cow herd is, is healthy. Um, and I think you still go back, as I mentioned before, it's still that structural integrity. You know, these cattle that can thrive and they can move wherever they're at, if they're on the Gulf Coast or if they're in, in, in North Dakota. So I think it's really important. Hard to talk about consumer trends without mentioning certified Angus beef. What are your thoughts? Yeah, Kevin, I think that's right. That, that you know, there's demand for high quality product and we, there's that's still a growing demand and we want to uh, achieve that with genetics. But I think, you know, the sustainability concept that, that we think about too, you know, just improving things like pregnancy rate. We can have all that together. Uh, we can have a more efficient system that makes better use of our resources uh, through genetic selection. We just got to use the data and apply it. Chip, key trends or consumer issues? But the consumer issues are wide open and they're moving fast and furious, right? And so uh, clearly we've mentioned those already. So a couple things I would take. It, it still boils down to two pieces, as was just mentioned. Your cow's got to last. Mm -hmm. And these calves, these terminal calves have to have value. Now how value is determined is certainly going to evolve with time. I would suspicion as we lose some of the tools that are in Colin's toolbox, as we talked about a little bit ago, some of the prophylactic use of various products as they continue to become less prevalent in our business. We're gonna to have to find ways to get to 1,600 pounds, still produce a product, an animal that is healthy in a feed yard can tolerate that environment. And so again, we are gonna to have to be very diligent at looking at not only within population genetic values for those pieces, we're gonna to have to be comfortable at least exploring the use of responsible crossbreeding to help because again, it will help with helpfulness really fast in a lot of situations. And reproduction. Uh, well, yes, on the cow side and on the feedlot side, yeah. given some of the dynamics that are facing that business right now. And so I think we have to look at how fast it's moving on the other end, but then take a deep breath and say, okay, what are the tried and true tools that are in our capacity sure. to use to address those things and to still give us flexibility downstream to navigate those waters? Colin, what would you add? So, uh, you know, I think for all commercial producers, it boils down to profitability. You know, if they can't stay in business, they, they can't really utilize any of the tools and the, the programs that we have in place. So uh, I think making sure that we continue the march towards efficiency, which I think ties straight into sustainability and longevity of cows, and, and then making sure that the cattle can, can meet the market needs and the market demands at that time uh, so that these guys can reach a profit and, and be profitable in their own programs. Yes, indeed, we can't be sustainable unless we make a profit. That's a great way to summarize it.